Yeah, so again, my name is Carrie Bush. I am a board member for MinWift, and I'm lucky to be the moderator for this discussion with two of my good friends, Molly Worry and Mike P. Nelson. Um, I'm gonna introduce them in just a bit, but I do wanna let you know if you're interested in becoming a board member for MinWIF, please do it. We have a lot of great events upcoming in starting in January, 2022, um, including networking events that could connect you with industry professionals if you're just starting out or if you're interested in getting into different departments. Um, we're definitely gonna do a big networking event along with some other great fun and exciting for sure events. So please check us out at uh, the link that Sandy will put in the chat, um, minwif.org. Um, okay, I will start out by introducing our talented panelists. Um, first, Molly Worry is a award-winning director with a range of accolades, including Best Fest, Best Director, Audience Choice Award, and Best Shorts Awards. Her films have received repeated grant support from the Jerome Foundation and IFP Minnesota, which is now Film North. Um, Min Molly is a commercial director for companies such as Target. She directed a Don't Buy It project, a PSA that helped convince the NFL to donate $3 million in ad space during the Super Bowl of uh, 2018, which dramatically expanded the reach of the anti-sex trafficking message. Molly is slated to direct the horror feature Preserved in winter of 2022 with Battle Cry Productions. Mike P. Nelson says, if the apocalypse were to happen tomorrow, tomorrow you would find Mike sipping on an old fashioned in his backyard reveling in the fact that now he could go out and shoot a post-apocalyptic revenge film entirely practical. Whether he's writing or directing, Mike's focus remains creating stylized, character-driven work. Sure, he might like the dark, weird, gritty nature of storytelling, but underneath all that cool midnight madness is something warm we call heart. And boy, is it tasty. He wrote and directed his first first feature film, The Domestics, with MGM, and just released Wrong Turn for Constantine Films in, 2020, in January of 2021. He is currently in development on three features, including two of his own screenplays. So we are really excited and Hello. happy to, to uh, introduce these two wonderful filmmakers, Mike P. Nelson and Molly Worry. Yay! Yay! Um, for those of you that have just joined, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna go through some questions. We're gonna share um, a clip uh, from one of Mike's film and from a sizzle reel for Molly's film that's in development right now. And um, hold that with more questions and then we will get into any questions that you all might have. But welcome everybody, yay, we're happy to have you all here. Um, so I'll start with our, the first question, um, and that is how and why did you gravitate towards the genre of horror? And I don't know who would like to start, Molly or Mike. I can, Thank you, Molly. I can take it. Um, ever since I was a little girl. Oh, is that the dinging you're hearing? No, okay. I'm going to mute mine. Okay. okay. Um, Ever since I was a little girl, like early on, um, I wrote I, I wrote stories that were scary and I made movies that were horror and I read books that were, that's what I gravitated towards. And I think I still do obviously is dark content. Um, my parents kind of, I'm the third child. So they were kind of like, they didn't pay attention to what I was doing, you know what I mean? And my dad was a big Stephen King fan. Um, so they they just basically, they were encouraging of, I remember as a real young girl, like little, little girl, my mom describing um, Friday the 13th premise to me, you know? And I can just like, 
hear it, you know, I, I remember like sitting on the couch and her talking about the camp and, you know, and him um, dying and coming back and stuff. And so they kind of just let it go and let, let me uh, watch whatever I kind of wanted to. Um, little did they know I had like ideas that somebody was going to chop my head off every time I washed my hair in the morning. But <laughs> and then also, I think it also like I, I was the type of kid who got a little bit flagged because I would write stories that in like third grade early on that were called like suicide spelled totally wrong um, <laughs> about blowing my brains in at the end of a like a thing that like was like supposed to start out as sort of a nursery where I am with a ghost, but um, apocalyptic, of course, but um, so I've always sort of gravitated towards it. I've never thought that even though I made a lot of like, as a kid, the first movies I was making were horror movies. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm aiming to be a horror film genre um, director, but definitely uh, very much dark content. And this film that um, I'm upcoming to direct is uh, sort of both. Uh, it could kind of like be considered dramatic, dark dramatic, but just by nature or by technically it's a horror as well. So that's the background. Uh, okay, um, so so sim similar actually uh, to to Molly, um, grew up always into loving monsters, um, monster movies, wrote monster stories. Um, I think one of the first, one of the earliest stories that I ever wrote, um, or the one that we'll say that my parents still hung on to, uh, was when I was in kindergarten, and one of the first stories I ever wrote was about the wolf man killing somebody. Uh, so it, it, it kind of took a downward spiral from there. But what's really interesting is um, I was not allowed to watch uh, horror films growing up at all, um, with the exception of like anything black and white, really. So like Universal Monsters, like, of course, I could watch like the old school ones, Creature from the Black Lagoon, that was all fun. Um, anything old sci-fi, but like anything that was like 70s and up was kind of off the table. Um, so naturally, I gravitated towards that stuff later because I loved it when I was younger and then I wasn't allowed to watch it. And then suddenly I'm like, well, that's what I want to, that's what I want to see. That's what I want to do. So continually just kept writing stories and um, making, you know, crappy little short horror films with my friends. And I just continued to, to go for it. And here, here, here we are. <laughs> So, Awesome. You know, this kind of leads into another question. Um, so, Mike, and you can start with this one. Like, so you made films with friends and little things here and there. And then all of a sudden, what happened? Tell us if you could tell the story of your first uh, opportunity you had to direct your first feature. Yeah, I mean, so I went to I, I went to uh, college at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design uh, for filmmaking, and um, got a four year BFA in filmmaking there. And um, you know, prior to that, it was just again, it was a lot of just run around shooting stuff, shooting other people's stuff, you know, shooting my own stuff, um, and, and that kind of thing. And then uh, after college. You know, shot some stuff during college, of course, but then after college, it's like that's kind of when you really start to learn stuff. Like you really start to stuff really starts to stick, if you will. And so I just continued. You know, I you know right outside of college, I was working at a grocery store for a year, um, and then let's see, then I started shooting weddings, and uh, then I did some like industrial videos, did some motorcycle videos for. Uh, Polaris, um, like the motorcycle company for some of their like snowmobiles and stuff. And, but in between all of that, working and like finding jobs here and there, uh, I was always making films with my friends, you know, whether it was like, you know, no budget features or um, short films. Uh, I did an anthology film way back in the day with a bunch of MCAD uh, grads called Summer School, which is a horror film kind of homage to our favorite uh, horror films. And um, just kept making stuff, like just kept making stuff. And I remember when I graduated, cause you know, they, 
you, you leave school and they always ask you like, what's your goal? What's your goal leaving college? And I just remember, I was like, well, 10 years from now, I want to make, I want to make a Hollywood feature film, 10 years. And um, just kept doing it, got a job as a sound designer here in town, working at uh, Undertone Music with Tom Hamilton, uh, did sound design and Foley and stuff for shows like Diners, Drives and Dives, and um, still kept working, still kept making shorts, kept helping people with other people's projects, either shooting them or acting in them or editing them, whatever it was, just kept making stuff on the side. I uh, got hired by a company in town called Make, um, which is run by uh, Daniel Rabashkin, and it's like a visual effects animation company, and they hired me to start a live action uh, sector of the company, um, and we started doing PSAs and anything that we could shoot to like blend visual effects in with, with, with live action footage. So did a bunch of commercial work there, then I got the opportunity to do some the Studio Luma thing, which was this uh, um, uh, this kind of TV episodic uh, learning uh, uh, sh educational program that was shot here in, in the Twin Cities, and that was a great experience. But again, while all of this was happening, I was making my own stuff, going up north, you know, taking a crew of ten up there, shooting, you know, a violent post-apocalyptic short, and I would come back and I would shoot people like shampooing hair and then I would two weeks later would go back up and finish and blow blow the head off or you know do the the machine guns or the whatever it was so I just kept doing kept making and then suddenly um that here I just gotta take this off here suddenly what happened was is um a friend of mine was like hey Mike uh looking for looking for stuff do you have anything I'm like oh, I have a short and you know a script um he goes we'll send it because it wasn't doing anything on my computer it was just sitting there so i sent it out to him and he um was um friends with the guy his name is kurt johnstead and he had written the film 300 and had a connection with a company called hollywood gang and um hollywood gang read the script they liked it and so i sat and i um just developed the script further with them for it was about a year, I think, at least. Um, and then finally, they started taking it out. And we went and we started, I started going to pitches. And so we went in and started pitching to uh, to studios uh, out in LA. And the first one, we got a no. Second one, we got a no. And then the third one was MGM. And they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll let you know. And then we're like, all right, let's go to the next one. So we stopped, we grabbed some coffees, and we got a call literally an hour later. And they're like, we want it. We'll take it right now. Like it's on the table, like you gotta tell us though, yes or no. And we were like, uh, yes. <laughs> and so we went for it and um, yeah, the rest is history. But again, I think the one thing that I realized was not only like, was there just constantly making stuff up to that point, which I think is the biggest thing. Um, I gave myself a goal, you know, like I said, when I graduated uh, MCAT, I said 10 years, I'm doing this. And it was like just over 10 just almost 11, I should say, um, that uh, it ended up happening. So pretty dang close. And, um, you know, hopefully I'm, the, the, the goal is to, to keep doing it, to keep making, to keep the hustle. And uh, it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of hard work. It's um, infuriating at times, but I honestly don't know what else I would be doing right now. So um, that's, that's the short version of the story, but I hope that uh, that, that uh, connected. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for all that, the history and the, um, just the drive of continuing to make stuff and create stuff. You know, you never know who the next person that you send something to, what might lead, what might lead from there, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, just, and, and, as, and one other thing just to, to mention too, like I was also, um, you know, there was, you feel, you know, there's, there's a lot of like, you know, pressure I remember at the time to to get into film festivals and I've actually gotten into just like a couple film festivals in my entire life a lot of my stuff has been rejected by film festivals and so I think another thing to 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 note is if your stuff isn't getting taken by festivals it's not the end of the world the festival circuit is not the end all be all um and honestly the way that I was discovered with the exception of a buddy of mine was um, uh, through online, just online presence. I'd put my stuff up online and people would watch it. 
and then people threw threw a link out to somebody uh, and then then that link got passed around and suddenly I get a phone call hey hey uh, you know and stuff just starts to snowball so use use an online presence like I mean that is a great uh, great way to to promote yourself and your work and, and to to create a presence of, uh, of your artistic visions and stuff so good advice that's really great advice um Molly what about you I know you have done the hustle for a decade over a decade as well and now you have this opportunity to make your first feature after doing a handful of short films and other things and you're on mute now I'm just going to warn you that before you start talking thank you um, <laughs> but um you know you are now connected with a, a company that is helping you to develop your first feature. Can you yeah. talk to us about that? Yeah, um, when, I, when I started in filmmaking, like if I take it back a little bit to like just where my mentality is as a like, how am I gonna approach all of this? Back when I was in film school, I remember being in the writing class and realizing like I remember having them talk about I always knew I wanted to direct and make films but like I thought maybe I could write too and I've done a lot of like writing and collaborating and that kind of stuff as well but from the get-go I knew that when and this is kind of where it stemmed or it's a, a way of kind of expressing it is that the teachers were talking about if you want to be a writer you have to write and write and write and write and write that may not be the truth but what I took from it was I want the best, I want whatever I make, I want to collaborate with the best uh, everything. And, and I want to become the best director I can be. So I wanted to put all of my effort in as much as like I've still uh, definitely exercised the writing side of it and exercised a bunch of different sides that can help improve, improve you as a director. I knew I needed to focus on directing. It was a little bit of a slow process for me, but again, like, I always want, the minute I started working in film, right after I um, got out of film school, I started script supervising and I started working on movies right away. And the movies were made for, you know, they were feature length films made for $250,000 or less, or to sometimes $25,000 or whatever it is. And I recognized immediately how compromised the films were. And so my first goal was, I, if I'm gonna make, my first movie is not gonna be a feature, it's gonna be a short. And I wanted to try to make a, a short that would be like, I wanted to come up with a budget that you would maybe come up with for a low budget feature and do that kind of a level for a short. Um, of course, you know, <clears throat> we didn't, you know, still you end up having to, um, you know, pull resources and stuff like that. I made a film, Carrie and I co-directed a film together. We co-wrote together. Um, so we have a long background together as well. And we put everything into it. And so the way that I sort of approach all projects is I just want each one to be as like most effective as possible in communicating with the audience and getting what we, you know, kind of like getting what we want across. Um, so I, it took me a lot of years to finish. And plus I had three babies, but still I was like, I, Carrie can attest like I was uh you know holding babies as they're spitting up and feeding them while we're in meetings and making movies like day, like day not days but within weeks after c-sections and um so I, I mean not that I'm trying to say like that makes me special or anything but I think like what I've recognized is like there there isn't anything that's going to stop that goal so I work in I work in film in a bunch of different other ways just to like maintain my paycheck and it has helped me you know be a you know improve directing but at the heart of everything it's all about storytelling for me and it's um so feature film and tv storytelling all of that I think is where I'm always putting my most energy into even if it takes years to kind of move it along especially because Again, I was told, so when I started with Preserved, I got, um, I, I optioned it from a very good friend of mine who we made a short film together and now she's like really pretty successful moving up Winona Wilms. Um, and I optioned it from her pretty, a lot of years ago now. Um, and I saw some 
a lot of potential in it. And um, I, I originally started bringing in, I said, this time I'm not gonna produce it. I'm not gonna be the one who goes off and tries to get the money. And I had people, you know, I had some friends that I, I asked for a lot of advice and I had some producer friends who said, you're gonna have to, you're the only person who can do that. You know, it's either the writer or the director, are really the only pe people I learned that can like really sell it with the passion that it needs to be, that needs to get behind it. So at first I, I wasted a little bit of time, but I made a lot of connections and I like refined my, you know, I was pitching to um, production companies and getting in, you know, um, different opportunities and people were biting on it and they liked it, but nobody was moving it really. And I'm not trying to give myself credit, but um, I, I think like, I think what I, I learned and like, I've been to a lot of, listened to a lot of people in, in panels and stuff like that. And I resonate with the, the idea that you are going to be the person who makes your projects happen. And you're going to be the person who is going to be able to communicate it the way that you're going to communicate it. And so at, in a couple of years ago, before the pandemic and at Catalyst, I kind of just separated myself from the different producers that were, you know, seemed to be on board, but really weren't. Um, and I, I just re I just like went for it, like everything that I could do getting in front of people. Um, and that's when I realized like, it's really about tracking people down, connecting with them, having the right materials in front of them and being able to uh, as much effectively communicate what this is going to be like, um, get them excited about it. Um, so uh, eventually, I, I feel like I made some strides and eventually through online, there was a, a during like during like total lockdown, I got lucky with a women's group that no longer exists about like, you know, 50 like thousand or it was like a large amount of women from all over um, that are like supporting each other. And so I heard um, that there was a women horror company that was just starting out and they had three um three they have funding for the first three features um and so i got connected with them and their battle cry and uh so that's how i got connected um and i feel like i want to say one more thing but i can't remember and i'm all still going on and on but i'll leave it there for now but <laughs> okay cool yeah thank you guys for sharing i mean it's especially if you don't live on the coasts, you know, or in Atlanta or places that have, you know, that just kind of cultivate filmmakers even more. Like it's hard, like when you live in the middle. Yeah. And maybe it's the same on, on the coast too. I don't know. Um, but you really have to, you have to, you have to hustle. Actually, I remembered what I wanted to say just to round it out was just that, um, the one thing that people kept telling me is they kept saying, nobody's going to give a first time feature filmmaker more than $250,000. And, but I knew my film, this film in particular needed at least 2 million, you know, I knew, and they're like, that's never going to happen. Everybody, everybody told me that. And um, it's just like, that that's something that I, I wouldn't that's why I think it took me longer to get to that point but to know that like if you know what you want to make and you know what it and you know what it really takes to make it you have to you have to make it for that you can't compromising it just ends up being it's going to fall apart basically 100 percent. that was awesome good point and I think now um would be a good time to show the Molly's clip for preserved. So Molly, talk a little bit before we push play, but you obviously haven't shot preserved yet, but you are in development with the script and other aspects of pre pre pro. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe yeah. set up what we're going to see the little clip that we'll see here? Yeah, I think most effectively is the pitch deck, which we don't need to see, but just so like that's where you can more effectively communicate everything, every aspect of it um, in writing and pictures and all of that. This, um, I had to put together a sizzle pitch pretty quickly, um, but it basically, I kind of set it up where in the beginning, I kind of made it like where it's sort of a tra trailer um, 
where you get the vibe of the music, you get the vibe of character, you get the vibe of how it's going to be shot. So I kind of split it up where in the beginning you kind of get the vibe of cinematography. And if you really went deep into like, like if I'm explaining it to people in text and stuff, like there's more to it, but right as it is, it's just uh, images. And then at the second half of it, it's more of like showing the, uh, the horror vibe. Pulling clips from other movies, basically, reference stuff. Great, yeah. Let's uh, let's show it. Carrie, are you seeing the video screen that says "preserve sizzle" or my messy screen? Nope, you're good. This is you're perfect. Just push play. I think we're good. Be nice. Ain't like families who had lost their wheat crop, lost their corn crop, lost their livestock, facing the winter without feed or food. But there are thousands and thousands of families on Western farms who share the same difficulties. <laughs> I could have done without the rats at the end, Molly. I'll tell you that. We'll have to have a conversation about that one. But um, yeah, so that's great. So you, again, the sizzle reel is this tool that you use to communicate your vision. Yeah. So a lot of that was like in the beginning, it was like, this is how, you know, again, it's very like descriptive on how I'm like planning on shooting it. And then those shots sort of back up some of all of that, which I won't get into. And then the rest is like, kind of like the, the vibe of the story. There's snow, they, there's somebody stuck outside trying to get in. There's, you know, somebody barricading. There's a woman who's pregnant, you know, there's, um, and has a baby. So there's a lot of those aspects I just tried to draw um, to, to get the vibe. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay, so Mike, you you have directed two horror features at this point, um, and you are developing some screenplays or writing some screenplays right now as well. Can you 
and we're going to show a clip of one of your from one of your films but do you want to talk a little bit about the two films that you've made and set up the clip that we'll, we're about to see and you're on mute thank you <laughs> Uh, the first one that I did was a film called The Domestics um, that we shot back in uh, 2016. And um, that was the one that um, I was able to, to make with MGM and with uh, the story that I kind of told uh, previously was about. Um, so, I mean, it was, and it was a really kind of an eye-opening experience. Like, again, it was sort of this, my love song of, of, of post-apocalypse action and horror um, uh, but also just kind of the, the, the hardship of, uh, of marriage and, and setting that uh, in this, with this backdrop of, of, of the apocalypse. Um, and it was fun, it was very eye-opening. There was a lot, of, uh, a lot of crazy stuff that happened when we were doing that, but um, you know, it, was, it was fun. They, they took a shot on it and uh, it was a time when MGM was really doing um, some daring things. And, trying to, to, to make some, some lower budget uh, genre fair. And um, it was cool to get in on that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was something, it was, it was uh, eye-opening working with a, a bigger studio and um, the politics that are involved. And um, um, the stories that you hear of the executives screaming in their office and swearing at people is 100% true. It's not a made up thing. It actually happens because I was in that room. <laughs> um, uh, but ultimately, again, like I think, and I think we can all attest to this, like we all love, you know, we all love the filmmaking process. We all, there's some, there's something kind of magical about all of this. And, um, you know, taking that run with my first feature was, I, I would, wouldn't give it up for anything. It was, it was hard, but it was, it was definitely um, uh, something that, uh, um, it was an experience for sure, um, but the, the 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 real learning um, curve happened when after that one was done. You know that one was done. It came out uh, summer of 2018, and um, it was great. You know we we premiered it uh, down at, in Chicago at this uh, this genre fest down there, um, Cinepocalypse, and it was it went over very well and. Um, and then it was kind of like, but, you know, up until that point, like I'd been looking for more work, looking for more jobs, like I'd been reading scripts, I'd been writing scripts, I had a script that we were going out to pitch with. And I'm thinking, gosh, I got one feature done. This should be, this should be pretty, pretty easy. Like, at least I got my foot in the door. Like now things are going to start happening. And they didn't. And there was a no. And then another no. And then another no. And another no. And another no. And another no. And I'm just like, Okay, okay, and then you know my managers and my agent are a bit. Well, we have, let, let's let's we have a project here that you might be interested in. And then there was this there's this shark movie, and I'm like, oh boy, shark movie. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see what it is, you know. And then, so I got to meet this great this great writer, this John Scott, who had written the movie Maggie uh, with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the zombie film, and uh, we started talking, and he had this great idea for the shark film, and I was like, great. So took took the material. Uh, went out and we pitched the town like we went to like I think it was 11 or 12 studios in town and just pitched to all these executives and it was such a great learning experience like holy crap just being able to get in the room and to, to pitch that um, to pitch your vision um, is also cool working with a, with a writer too like being in the room with, with another writer and, and, and talking about this um you know making like sitting there pitching the idea and boom making somebody jump and the executives are like oh my god you're like i fucking have this i have this i have this this is in the bag no 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 and i'm just like oh my god what am i doing like and i remember just thinking to myself i'm like well shit i'm some guy in minnesota nobody knows and uh I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was, it was a one and done thing. Cause it just, it just seemed like not to mention, you know, finances started getting tough and we're, I'm trying to figure out like, well, do I need to like start focusing in on other things? And, and, you know, I really wanted to, but, you know, speaking to, to what, what uh, Molly said, you know, it's like, you want to make it work. You want to make it happen. 
And so you just keep saying, no, I'm not going to stop this. You know, it's like I had, a, I had a, a, a young son at the time as well. And so it's like, we're providing for him. Uh, my wife, you know, has a job, had a job and she was looking for new work and I'm trying to find a new, another movie. And I'm thinking, I don't know if this is going to happen again. Um, but kept going and I remember you know and this is this is also a great thing about like I feel very very fortunate I'm, my wife Katie I've uh, been married to her now for 11 years and I remember uh, talking to her in this moment I'm just like I don't know what to do and she goes well do you still want to make you still want to is this what you want to do is, do you want to make movies right and I'm like yeah she says well then just keep going and that was the scariest thing that I had to do because I had no idea bank account was running thin and it was like all right here we go and um opportunity came up i got a script and it was called wrong turn and i just about crapped my pants because i was like oh my god wrong okay let's see what this is about i mean i read a shark script before so how, how could this be any worse um and uh i read it and it was very different than what i expected very unique and I thought it had a really interesting interesting story interesting characters and um an interesting like an interesting hook that that I wasn't expecting so I was like okay yeah I'm into this I, I think this is cool got to meet the writer this Alan McElroy who I've, I'm working on a project with right now he's fantastic uh, fantastic writer um he also works on the new Star Trek series and we just hit it off and I was able to um, pitch to Constantine who, which by the way, was one of those companies that I pitched to with that crazy shark movie. And what I realized was that shark movie, I got a lot, of, we, we never got made, nobody really wanted to make it. And, um, but, but one thing that always stood out as a reminder to me was, I pitched uh, this executive, Robert Colzer, that shark movie. And he ultimately passed, but he really enjoyed that pitch. And so when he found out that I was interested in making the script, he goes, yeah, is that the guy with shark, that pitched a shark movie to me? I said, and uh, my manager was like, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's Mike. And he goes, yes, I want to hear his take. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. I, I want to hear, I want to hear this. And so what that showed me was no's don't necessarily always mean no. You are constantly meeting new people. You are going to hear the reject. Uh, you're going to get the reject button uh, more times than you're ever going to get yes yeses. But you have to look at that as I got to get in front of somebody and see what I'm all about. And you're not going to connect with everybody. Uh, you know, I, I think that was a hard lesson to learn up, up front because there were places that I wanted to get in and I wanted to be like, oh man, this is the place I've always wanted to make stuff. It's never the place that you want to make the thing at. It's like, cause those are the places that for some reason, they just, they don't, there's not a connection, but like the place that you would never think in a million years, like in a, never in a million years that I think I would make a wrong turn film, never. It was never, never on the list, but there it is. And never did I think I would, I would meet this, this producer, Robert Coles, or I, they did the Resident Evil films. And that wasn't in my voc vocabulary. It wasn't the kind of films I was into yet. I was able to make, a film and really enjoy making that film and feel proud of that film working with these people that I would have never thought I would have worked with in a million years and I think it's just that like that game of being open and um you know I think uh Molly said this too like not um taking your vision and not not backing down from it and just, and owning it. Like if you can own what you're all about, own your style, own you, you are ultimately selling you constantly in this business. Like just, just like an actor gets up and does auditions as a director, even as a writer, you are constantly selling yourself to, to, to these people with, that have money. That, that is if you wanna go into to, to feature filmmaking or, or, or get the financing for your movie, you are selling yourself. And, nobody's going to buy you if you are just trying to please them you have to go in with a strong point of view and you have to say this is this is it this is me this is what i'm about and this is the story and it kicks fucking ass and more times than not 
you will get, and if you, you might not get yeses, but you will get the people who will say, um, who will respect that. And you might hear from them again um, if, you do, if you don't get that yes. So um, keep, uh, yeah, you, you just, I'll come back to the theme of, of, of this discussion. You just have to keep going, just keep going. And then, yeah, that's. I love it. Keep going, y'all. Y'all got this. You just have to keep doing it. Um, hey, Mike, tell us what we're going to watch, the clip from uh, Ron Chern. What, what was going on here? Um, this was this is kind of one of the chase sequences. Um, this jumps in uh, the our, our young adults who are hiking in the Appalachian Trail. Um, prior to this scene, um, they they actually they kill somebody in the woods um, who they think is is hunting them. Um, you know, guy with a skull mask, and they bash his brains in because they think he was going to hurt them. And so now this group of people that are connected to that guy that they killed are coming after them. And so they're running, uh, running away, trying to escape, have no idea what these people are about, what their intentions are. Um, they're just assuming right now that they are trying to kill them. And so this is um, our lead, Charlotte Vega, and then um, um, Aiden Bradley, uh, who plays her, her boyfriend, uh, running for their lives. Scary. Um, uh, I, that's scary. Um, okay. So you guys, we have like 10 minutes left. I have so many questions, but I really want to open it up to anybody that's watching to ask uh, their questions at this moment and have a dialogue. Um, please, if you have a question, um, just feel free to ask it. Um, I have a question from Molly. Um, I know you had mentioned uh, getting involved with a group of three women horror filmmakers. Was that correct? Um, what can you tell me the name of that group? Yep, um, Battle Cry Productions. Okay. Um, they there is now two of them, but um, yeah. So that's the the company is called Battle Cry. Okay. And mm -hmm. Molly, where are they based? They're based in LA. In LA, yep. But we are shooting in, in Minnesota, it it's, seems. Last year we started and we were, uh, we hoped, it's a winter film, snowstorm film, and it got pushed too far into the spring as we were casting, but um, we were gonna be shooting in New York because the incentives, now that we have incentives here and a lot of what we're doing to make sure that up north we have like the, um, the the companies and uh sort of the infrastructure in place there too uh we're gonna be maybe shooting in minnesota so i'm really excited about that that's a sidebar so awesome god that's yeah. so good i know yeah. i know, yeah. oh. Obviously, oh, I know. In minnesota you have your people yeah. here your the people that you've come up with the people that you trust and that you've worked with which is so important um and so that's super exciting that you 
you know, that you, that that's an opportunity to bring your team on the people that, you know, not that to say that you couldn't work with just randos, but you know, it's going to be a better movie here because we have more in place. We have better locations. We have, it's just going to go faster. We're going to spend less money just based on the fact that we are, it's more efficient here. So, yeah. We have a question in the chat from TP wondering what your advice is on dealing with agents slash managers. If you could both maybe touch on that. I'll let Mike take that. Um, I mean, is, is it more like, so dealing with or finding, like, is, is there, uh, I mean, in terms of, of getting one, um, finding, okay. Um, so I found my agent through posting my work online, um, which again, is where I'll come back to make cool stuff, put it up for people to see, because you never know who's watching out there. And it just so happened that some random guy, I still remember his name, his name is Freddie Avalos, and it was on Vimeo. And he somehow found the, one of the clips of, of a film that I uh, did called The Retirement of Joe Corduroy that then got sent to Todd Brown at XYZ Films, who used to run a site called Twitch Film, who then contacted me and said, hey, this looks really cool. Can we put, put this on our site? Which their site has huge following. And I was like, absolutely. So they put the trailer up there and uh and then eventually put the whole film up and then i get a call from uh my agent now daniel cohen who i didn't sign with for four until four years later but i stayed in touch with him and uh uh he was like i love this i want to keep in touch with you um here's my number uh my email reach out to me let's let's talk like if you got something if you got a script like let's 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 talk about this and so every single year of those four years that I knew him before I, I signed with him, because this was the four years before I, I made domestics, I made a trip out to LA and I would email him and I would say, hey, Dan, I'm going to be out in LA uh, in like two weeks. Uh, you want to go grab coffee? I wasn't going to be in LA, but I just wanted to see what he said. And he goes, yep, I'll be around. Let's do it. What was I doing? I bought a freaking ticket to LA and I went and I stayed with friends on a couch and I met with this guy for, you know, maybe an hour, hour and a half. And hung out for a couple more days and then went home. And I did that, uh, yeah, I did that four times. And I always kept in touch with him. He sent me scripts from the blacklist that, you know, uh, he, he, sent me, he sent me stuff to read. He's like, Mike, check this out. Like, let me know what you think about this. Um, but then when domestics came along, he was a guy that I could go to and that I could trust and that I confided in and was like, hey, so this is happening right now. I think I'm gonna need your help. And he's like, I got you. And he, he helped me put it all together get all like the crazy stuff he helped me find a lawyer he helped me like make sure that nobody was jerking me around like so ultimately it comes back to make really cool work that's you and put it out there get it out there in front of people agents are looking for people with a strong voice and as long as that voice is there like agents get submissions all the time and they can't look at everything they can't watch everything they can't read everything so the more you can just put your stuff out there and be okay with it just being out, whether people see it or not, it's, the, it's that adage is like, as soon as you stop worrying about getting the agent or finding somebody to, to get your script or, or whatever, suddenly somebody just wants it <laughs> or suddenly, some, so, suddenly somebody notices. So again, I'll come back to it. I keep saying this. I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. Just keep making stuff and put it out there. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. It's long-winded, but still, that's that, that's how I went about it. Awesome. Does anybody else have questions? I have a question uh, for Molly. Molly, um, how did you arrive at two million for the future budget? Um, I, I I think just in my brain, I well, just because I've worked on so many movies, so I know. <laughs> I mean, just, I, I'm a script supervisor too. So I've worked on a lot of, mostly um, the, the experience that I have working on features is as a script supervisor. And um, I know how much the budget is and I know how many days we're shooting. 
and I know, you know, and I know what the content is and I know how long it takes to shoot the stuff and I know what grows the budget and et cetera. Um, so I think I just kind of knew at least had to be that. It could definitely be more, um, but then the, the minute, you know, it's like, that's the minimum you can kind of go for, which is also like, there's a lot of stunts. There's, uh, there's a lot of set builds, there's fires, there's horses and babies and animals and um, a lot of special makeup effects. So I, I just kind of, I, I think I just did the math a little bit uh, arbitrarily in my head and the low number is 2 million. Yeah. Uh, and I still hope to get the, the days that I, I think it will take to shoot. But um, the other thing is I do want it to be union and I'm also in the union. And I, as a crew member, I, I, I wanna, you know, that I have that mentality too, um, not just as like the producer side and director side of it. And I wanna spend some of the money there too, you know, on making sure that we have, uh, people are getting paid what they need to get paid and that kind of thing. But it, it is tricky because the minute you're at 2 million, it's sort of like everybody's rates go down. Yeah. Uh, you know, because of the way that it's structured, it's like, so to have more would be better. So if you know anybody looking to give us more money, <laughs> I'll ask around. we'll raise the budget. Okay, cool. Yeah. And it always helps to have a background in filmmaking or working professionally in the industry to understand how much things cost. You've worked on a lot of features as a script supervisor and you've said other positions, but. Um, okay, we're almost at our time, you guys. I am an AD, so I am aware of our time and I don't want to go over uh, because this is what we've all committed to, but I do want to ask if there's any other kind of other questions. We've, we've hit a lot of the ones that I had. Um, Chris, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Molly, uh, you, you know, you say you're a script supervisor. Do you do, and, uh, you know, Mike, you can chime in too. Uh, do, you, do you do a lot of your work there in Minnesota or do you go down to LA or? Mostly Minnesota. Um, and I do like sometimes if it's a Minnesota connection or a film that's sort of associated with Minnesota will travel. Um, but LA connections have all just been me reaching out for preserve, you know, uh, the other sort of markets the only connection I've really had there has been in just trying to reach out to get preserved made. Nobody takes me seriously as a script supervisor, unfortunately. So that, that isn't how I've made my connections. I've had to sort of separately do that. It's surprising that there'd be that much, there'd be, you know, there would be work in Minnesota. You never hear about work in Minnesota. You know, I've seen some films made there, but you know, Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're from you're from Florida? Yeah, from Jacksonville. And uh, Jacksonville actually has had a, a, a had a lot a number of films made here. When I first came down, that mm -hmm. all dried up uh, when the 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 uh, incentive started. And Florida had no incentive, you know, they 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 yeah. so yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the incentive. You know, I started in the industry back in 2006 when after the heyday of, there used to be a lot of films filmed here, like Grumpy Old Men, One, Two, and Three, like Jingle All the Way, Mighty Ducks. Like this was the heyday of filmmaking uh, in Minnesota. Um, but, you know, I've been working in the industry freelance as a, as a AD, sometimes producer, sometimes director for 17 years working mostly in Minnesota, but I've also work a lot in Chicago and New York and other tax incentive states. It's all about the tax incentive, you know, and we're hope we're building it. We're trying, we're trying here in Minnesota to get a better tax incentive. Um, yeah, just, just to, to, to piggyback off that just very, very briefly. So uh, when I was doing the domestics, I wanted to, to film it here in, in Minnesota and because Minnesota had very little, if, if any, film incentive at the time, um, MGM was like, no. And I was like, but the movie takes place in Minnesota. Like I wrote it, it's like Minnesota and like, and, and, and Western Wisconsin. Yeah, we're not gonna film that. There's no tax incentive. Like we need to go somewhere with big incentive. And I'm like, okay, so 
where do you suggest? And they're like, you're going to shoot this movie in Louisiana. And I'm like, Louisiana looks nothing like Minnesota or Wisconsin. They're like, well, that's where you're going to shoot it. So shoot it there. We, we're not making it. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, okay. You can make it look like Louisiana, look like Minnesota. <laughs> and, and we did our darnest to do it. I mean, we just, we tried to find houses that weren't, you know, that didn't look too, uh, too Southern. And we just went down there and we made it happen. And, and again, that was a huge part of the learning, learning experience. But yeah, you're right. Incentives are, incentives are awesome. They're also uh, a pain. <laughs> mm-hmm. Allison, you had a question? Yeah, thanks for saying that. Um, so I had a question about pitching. Are there elements that are particular to horror on pitching or any tips you have like when you're actually pitching a horror feature, a horror script? I have a thought, but I, I, I'm i sure Mike has good stuff to say. Is it choppy right now as I'm talking? No, no, you're good. Okay, okay. Um, the biggest thing I've learned, uh, I, and it's been from panels and from like listening to podcasts and different things on pitching and stuff is that it all, nobody cares about plot. This is the quickest way I can say it. Nobody gives a shit about plot. We care about what happens to the person that's within the plot. So everything that you, you start with and go for, and, and even when you're describing the plot, it's all from that character's perspective. So what do we, you, you know, getting that, uh, care, you know, uh, empathy going. Yeah, I would, I would, I would hundred percent agree with that. Um, um, also, uh, when you get in the room, perform, just fucking perform. Like there's nothing wrong about, uh, uh, putting on a show because these people listen to these things all day, every day. Um, and to see something different and unique and to have a strong point of view is somebody that can come into the room and, and sometimes act out brutal murders. Or um, at one time uh, when I was pitching, I, I had a laptop and I played uh, this old um, Crystal's song, the 60s song in the background when I acted out the scene where this guy killed this guy. And it was just kind of like, everybody was just kind of like, oh, and what was great was everybody at the end of the day, at the end of the pitch was like, yeah, we can see this movie. Like, sure, I didn't, I didn't get the movie made, unfortunately, but it got me back in more rooms after that. Like people wanted me to come back. When I read scripts and I said I was interested, they were like, yeah, yeah, we want them back in the room. Don't be afraid to go big when you're in the room. Um, it, I know it's appreciated and just with some friends who do work at studios, they love to see that. And it, it, it can make, it can also make the experience for you a lot more fun <laughs> than if you're just like behind the desk and you're like looking at these people who seem like they're staring down at you. Get up, be free, move around. Uh, especially if you're pitching a horror movie, fucking kill somebody in the room, like fake kill somebody, like that's great. <laughs> That's good advice, you guys. Really awesome. <clears throat> um, any other questions? This is your chance. No? Um, well, I guess I have a question from an actor's standpoint. Um, how have you been casting your, your films, like, um, like for yours? Molly? Oh, for mine? Uh, um, yeah, the preserved. Uh, so, you know, the, the hard part is, is like, that's a hard part, I think, about being a director, working with uh, people who are also wanting to make money. Um, I, I'll do everything. All I can say about the process is uh, basically they want to go with what sort, not not they, but like, I think the industry, Hollywood, everybody is sort of programmed, especially casting directors and everything of like deciding who is gonna make us money, who's gonna put, you know, uh, people in seats. And there's something to that, but at the same point, it's like, I've seen a lot of, I've heard and seen a lot of, and not necessarily from the people I'm working with, but um, like a kind of an idea that 
if you're not that, if you're not making, if you're not going to bring a million people in to, to sell tickets, you're not really worth anything. The one thing that I, there's a lot of like against the grain that I'm going to continue, like that I personally ha have to like keep going against. And, um, and one of those things is to cast the right person, not just cast who sounds exciting. Um, and, you know, you, it can be completely wrong. So I think as, uh, so we were doing the casting director where, you know, vetting a bunch of different people's ideas, but it's finally getting more down to like, okay, maybe, maybe we, you know, should do it that, you know, this way or, or give this person a chance. I, I think, um, that's the best movies are made that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you don't have a lot of control. But go ahead, Mike. Yeah, it, it, it's true. There's <laughs> sometimes you don't have a lot of control. But again, like I think um, this is where, like, again, having a strong point of view can really come in handy. Um, you know, for for Wrong Turn, I remember there was this there was a big fight about casting somebody that had a lot of Instagram followers, which is oh shit. Um, it is the worst possible. Blech. Anyway, um, that was something that we had to fight against. And, you know, we had to bring people, we had to bring influencers into the casting office and, and actually like um, test them to prove that like, no, we really do want to work with a really good actor and not, the, the, I get it. They have 10 million followers, but that doesn't mean anything because the movie's not going to work if we hire this person. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of the battles that I was able to thank God win when we got Charlotte Vega in, in wrong turn, because, you know, she wasn't a super big Instagram presence. She was in like a couple of movies beforehand. Most of them were done in Spain. So it was kind of like, uh, and I'm, I remember going to them and it's like, you guys, we need to go with her. I, I just, I have a feeling you, and you gotta, you gotta trust me on this. Like we should go with her. And they gave it a day and they came back and I said, okay, all right, we'll go with her. You're good. And we did. And I honestly think she makes the movie in my opinion. Like she's the one that like, that, that sells, sells that story. Um, so Molly, to your point, like huge, huge deal. Go with the person that you feel like is the best. If, yeah, if you can. Yeah. Fight, but always fight. Yeah. Well, I have a question uh, on that uh, vein, uh, Mike. How did you know uh, of Charlotte Vega then? Where did you know, you know, how did you know of her? And, you know, what kind of tweaked your, um, uh, you know, uh, really got your interest in her then for this uh, film? So our, our, our casting uh, director, uh, Nancy Nair, um, who's out in LA sent a bunch of um, possibilities with reels and uh, clips from from their films, and then of course I, so Charlotte was on that list, and I was like, oh, like I feel like I, this she's familiar, and she was she was from a film called The Lodgers, which is a horror film. I think you can watch it on Netflix right now, um, but it was this it was a horror film that I think was made by uh, Dread Central, or at least Dread Central was produced it, and. Uh, I saw her work and I watched uh, a couple of the movies that she was in and she was fantastic. I was like, oh my God, like if we can get this caliber actress in a wrong turn movie, like we could flip this thing upside down. And um, she was totally into it and she really liked the script. She liked the character and we just, and, and like I said, it was, it was selling it to the studio, but ultimately like they, they bit and, and, and they went for it. So she was a really, you thought she was a really good actress, not necessarily, um, oh, she's just going to be perfect for this role. You, you know, you thought more generally, she's really good and she would be great in this role. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think she, uh, she's definitely a, a really great actress, but if you look at her, her other roles, she brought something very, she brought a lot of sincerity to, to the stuff that she did. And we ultimately, if you're going to follow this character for, you know, an hour and 49 minutes, like you got to buy it. You got to believe her. And like you watch her other movies and you're, you're along for the ride. Like when you're watching the movies that she's in, I was like, I, we need that in this movie. And she feels like Jen to me. So we got to go with it. Like, and we got to go now. And again, that's, that's how kind of how it all fell together. 
Cool. Maybe we do one more and be done by 7.15. Is there any, Carrie Jo, did you have one when you came up, when we saw your face? No. No, have... but hi. <laughs> hi. Nice to see everybody. Hey, Carrie Jo. Okay, cool. There's one last question. I Shoot, since, since we're here, yeah, heck yeah. Um, so oh, I heard Molly say, um, you know, that story is important and stuff. When y'all are writing your scripts, I mean, do you really nail down the theme? Sometimes I think with the horror, it's not always easy because I think, like, I like the kills. Like, mm. I think it's cool, you know, sometimes the way people are killed and stuff, but like, how do y'all deal with theme? Do y'all really nail that down or how do y'all deal with that? That's kind of, that's the first thing I think I'm drawn to is to see if there's anything, because I'm not really about, I like the dark nature of it, but it's really about the dark human nature. Um, the humanity of things that I'm drawn to is like, and so um, theme is really, really, theme and character are huge for me. And um, that's what I love about this film that we're making, that I'm hopefully gonna be able to make this winter. But um, I, when I first read the script, even the writer was like, I didn't have that in mind, but there was some in inspiration there. And interestingly, the themes kind of like started to line up more and more with what we're dealing with now in society as opposed to back when I was uh, trying to make it a couple years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I find that to be very important. And I think like, I think there can be several themes, but it's basically there's sub themes and then there's themes that back up the main theme and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, complete. I would 100% second all that um, theme and character, 100%. Um, often, like, I mean, I, I know with, in the case of domestics, you know, I wanted to write a movie about um, how marriage is, is challenging. Like that's ultimately what was at the core. But then I put that in a post-apocalyptic world. So it's like, that was, that was sort of a, the heart, that was the, the, the center, that everything, everything around that, even, even down to the violence and, and the scenes of violence, like I wanted to tie in and make sure that those moments, those scary moments, those intense moments, those scenes of violence, all paid tribute, all went back to what the middle was. And that was, you know, what, what, uh, what's at stake. And it was this, this marriage. Um, so I think that's hugely important. And I think that your kills and your eye candy will all be better for it. Cool. Well, I think that's a great way to end our time here together, you guys. Um, great advice, great insights from both of you. I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate everybody that has taken the time to join this conversation. And um, just wanna remind you, you know, we'll, we'll be doing a lot more events like this in person and online in 2022. So I really hope that you look out for, you know, either consider joining Minwift or just, you know, to our out of uh, town guests from Florida and from Texas. We really enjoy you guys being here as well. So keep checking out what's happening at Minwift in Minnesota, y'all. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. I know that uh, Sandy put the, um, uh, Minwift link website in the chat. Um, but yeah, I know th that you guys know Minwift or you know Wift, so you know how to find us as well. But thank but you very of, much. One of the nice things about um, our chapter is we have an internal private place where our members can meet. So we've posted all the recordings of our past events out there, voiceover, um, legal in the time of COVID tax, uh, film screenings. Um, I might be missing some cool ones, but so if you are interested, um, please check out the link. And one of the things we had not talked about in the past is what if you're a full fledged member of another club? Do we have a friends of deal? So that's something I'm going to bring up to the board of directors in Minnesota to see, do we want a friends of membership 
So you wouldn't have to pay a full membership um, if you're already paying full somewhere else. So maybe we'll talk about that and reach out to you. Is it Chris and, um, oh, was it Al Kristen or who was from Allison? Yeah, yeah. It's really cool that you found it on the, because we never know, you know, when we market these things, we never know where it actually goes and whose hands it gets into. So we appreciate you all showing up. Yes. And thanks again to Mike and Molly for, you know, telling us about your uh, experiences and your journey in this industry. So thank you all. Hey. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate thank you, Mike. It. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, yeah, guys. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie, for, for, for making this all happen. Awesome. Oh, yeah. I'm really glad it's fun. It was really very worthwhile for me as well. So. <laughs> and I miss you dearly. I miss you. Let's get an old fashioned soon. I know it has to happen. Okay, cool. Thanks, everybody. Be well, be safe. Take care of yourselves. Right. Make, the money. Make some you. stuff. Bye. Right. Thanks, Carrie. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.